this computer. Beautiful. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Kim Stewart here. And welcome to our very first Cups <laughs> of Tea with Kim. And I'm so delighted that Harry has joined me today, brave soul that you are. <laughs> and um, really, let me just set this up a little bit that um, I'm quite curious about the transition points in life. And I have witnessed enough talking to people and experiences in women's circles and some previous work that I've done to sort of really buy into the idea that how we do anything is how we do everything. Mm. And looking through that lens, looking at the transitional points in our life as to what they tell us about ourselves and what wisdom there is for each of us to learn because we all know that adversity happens, challenge happens as much as excitement and wonderful things happen, but we learn a lot about ourselves mm. through the adversity, through the challenge, through the discomfort. So I've got a curiosity around that. But um, so this is an off the cuff kind of conversation. We are just going to do a backwards and forwards, see where it goes. So um, yeah, let's get into it. So Carrie, please come out and share a little bit about yourself um, with the audience and then we'll jump into it. Groovy. Well, hi Kim and hi everybody who joins us later on. Um, so yeah, I'm Carrie. I live in Albany Creek, uh, which is north side of Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. So I live here with my hubby, John. We've been married for coming up on three years together for eight years. And we actually met through a mutual friend on Facebook, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, we have a gorgeous little girl, Luna. She's two and a half. And um, also my dad, Steve, lives with us now. So he's been a massive help, actually. We just realised he can put Luna to sleep in like five minutes. So Wow, what a <laughs> skill. I know. It's like, oh, my goodness, no stress, just straight to sleep. <laughs> so, um, and also have three beautiful cats. So we tend to attract cats, rescue cats, and cats that just want to land on our doorstep. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So my background's really um, a lot in the health industry as well. So, um, you know, grew up working in my parents' pharmacy from about grade eight until through to high school. So, you know, I knew how to, you know, work pretty hard from a young age, get my own money and my own money. And um, yeah, then I went to uni, actually did nutrition and dietetics and human movement studies. So I did two degrees in five years. And then it's pretty funny, I actually only worked in that field for like less than two years. I found um, the hospital space pretty hard to work in. Um, I think as an empath, it was pretty hard to see people transition and sickness and, and all of that. So, um, but that actually coincided leaving that around. Um, I was in a not so great six year relationship with a guy and um, grateful for that actually, because that got me onto the path of personal development and uh, you know, realizing what I didn't want in life and what I actually wanted to start to attract. And yeah, so I then moved into a family owned uh, Curves uh, health and fitness franchise with mum and dad. They bought that. And yeah, we gave it a good uh, red hot go for about six years, lots of long hours, stressed with the franchise, and ended up closing it about after about six years. And um, then I actually moved into disability support work, which I do a little bit of that still in between. Uh, my own business at home and, and Luna. So I work with a guy who has paraplegia and just help him um, help him go to the gym and also, you know, do a bit of personal care support work with him as well. Wow. So he loves oh, helping wow. people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, obviously that's the theme. <laughs> and, you know, it's no surprise to me as an empath and um, I, I've already learned something more that I didn't know about you. Um, I had a very similar start um you know I, I when i left school i went to college to become um well in those days it was a home a home economist oh, cool, so yeah. all about dietary that and i went my first job was at north shore hospital oh, and cool. i ended up working with a lot of um insulin dependent diabetics and also um uh, women that had experienced um, anorexia and um, that's very interesting that that memory's come up for me now because there was a woman that we used to that I used to care for in the hospital and each um, 
each time her son turned a year older, she ended back up in hospital with, mm. um, you know, really low body weight. Okay. And at that time, I was very curious and I thought, why hasn't somebody figured out this is about trauma around the birth of a baby? You know, wow. I mean, I was mm -hmm. an 18, 19 year old at that time. So, um, but that's interesting. And again, mm -hmm. same as you, being an empath, I just couldn't take the, mm -hmm. the, the loss over and over mm. again it just it just affected me so greatly so kudos to people that can manage those energies mm. um but wow okay that's um very interesting so um first of all i'd love to ask you you know like this is cups of tea with kim so mm. what tea are you drinking <laughs> yes what, what is your tea of choice today and why well i have to say i love this mug because it's just like a warm hug you can kind of just wrap your hands around it um, I've actually got lemon and ginger with some honey in it because we've, um, when we got back from Thailand recently, we all picked up a bit of a bug <laughs> and I'm still trying to hit that on the head a bit, but I just thought it's quite comforting. I find lemon, ginger and honey tea just kind of very comforting. So Beautiful, beautiful. And I love that you said that it's like a, you know, warm hug there in the mm. cup. My favourite tea and um, I'm not actually drinking it, in, to be completely transparent. I'm drinking water because I've raced in the door literally from right before mm -hmm. this started. But my, my, cup, my tea of choice is white rose. Oh. And I love it because it feels exactly like that. It feels like a warm hug mm. um, in a drink. Like white tea is so delicate and the mm. rose is just always so calming. So I'll write that one down. I've never is, actually heard of that one. Tea. Well, white tea is um, picked very early on. And um, so it's very delicate. And you've got to, um, you know, brew it at 80 degrees. It can't take boiling water kind of thing. So mm. um, anyway, so yeah, fantastic. So let's, um, let's transition a little bit into um, the um, having a cup of tea with your mother exercise, which mm -hmm. really came about, and I'll just give a little bit of a backstory to people that may not be familiar with that exercise. Um, you know, my mum passed away um, almost 10 years um, ago, 10 years this year, and, um, you know, my grief to, for her around her loss is still really... Um, is strong you know it's it's not ever far from my emotions how much I you know miss my mum and there was a time when I was feeling it a lot and I thought to myself you know just I, I miss the most is having a cup of tea with my mum mm. mm. and that kind of conversation and of course we've been women have been drinking tea not only women <clears throat> but particularly women drinking tea for ever around the fire, as medicinal tea, as, you know, ways of sharing and connecting. And so I chose to literally make a cup of tea and sit on my bed with my journal and have a conversation with my mum. And, you know, I've had good connection with my mum since she passed and it continues to get stronger and stronger. Um, but it was really beautiful and I got to say a lot of things um, and share a lot of things with her that were really raw for me and of course you know I received responses to those and you know it was just a very powerful exercise so um, it's it's not rocket science it's fairly simple to do and of course you can do it not only with your mum but any any relationship that um, you know, there's any unhealed business there. So I want to ask you, you know, did you choose to do that exercise with your mum? And if so, you know, how was it for you? Yeah, I did it with mum. And um, it's interesting because we don't have, we have a bit of a fractured relationship because of past stuff that has happened with the business. And um, uh, I grew up as a Mormon and chose to move away from, from that path. And uh, my mum is still on that path. And, um, but yeah, I just found it fascinating. It was quite quick, kind of the downloads that came with it, like the um, responses. But yeah, they were actually responses, which I really didn't, you know, like if she was sitting, I don't feel like she might necessarily actually say to me, but they came across. Yeah. As in, um, I mean, she does love me, but mum has never been the best at heartfelt 
conversation, uh, conversation connection. Um, yeah, so I got like, she loves me. I even got stop holding myself back, which to get from mum is very powerful. Like, I don't, that's not something I feel like mum would say right to my face. Yeah. Um, you know, she thanked me for looking after dad at the moment and having him here with us. And, um, yeah, she thinks about us often. So we don't connect a lot, even though she just lives about 20 minutes away. Oh, emotional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually, it was very powerful because yeah, the, um, actually having that heartfelt conversation with mum, um, doesn't happen a lot. So. Yeah. Mm. Wow. How mm. beautiful. And thank you for sharing that so openly. That's really, and sharing your vulnerability because it's, what I've come to understand is that, you know, my relationship was tumultuous with my mm. mother also. And I think that most people can relate to that. I mean, it's probably the most powerful relationship, right? Mm. And what happens is, or what I've, I came to understand was that my mother's pain and my pain just kept clashing. So we couldn't really hear each other very often. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we did have some lovely moments, absolutely. But there was a lot of the moments where my pain um, hit her pain and they it just, we were both very triggered. And once she, you know, when we're speaking on an energetic level, which of course, that's all my mum is now, mm. all being, all of her is that, um, there's no resistance. Mm. So her pain's not there anymore. So the conversation is, you know, just from her highest vibrational self. Mm, yeah. And I find that, you know, we can't always have these conversations, even, you know, when our mums are still earthside, mm. um, because, again, that's what's happening. You know, we're, we're look, both looking through our own wounds and it's really challenging to move from a, to a different place. But when we have that um, energetic conversation, mm. <laughs> then you get past the wounds. And that's why this exercise is so incredibly powerful, I believe. Mm. And in such a simple process, yet deep and profound. So, mm. um, Less resistance is yeah. coming up for me, just there's no resistance, yeah. Yeah, the no resistance, mm. exactly. So, And we feel like when we've been hurt by, from somebody um, or we perceive we've been hurt by somebody that is supposed to take care of us and love us unconditionally, well, we put our guards up. So mm. it, it makes perfect sense. So it's a really powerful exercise mm. um, and one that, you know, I will continue to use not only, I mean, I have an estranged sister. So, you know, I've done it um, once yeah. with that and I didn't go get very, to be, you know, fair, I didn't get very far with it, but I know I was holding back. Yeah. So I'll continue to work with that as well. So it is really mm. powerful. Um, I'm really wanting to move towards these, you know, transitional points um, around, you know, we've got these, we enter into the world, our birthing trans. Um, formational point, um, you know, transformation being moving from one state to another. So, of course, you know, coming into the world is one. But the ones I really want to focus on now are what I term as maiden, mother and marga. Mm -hmm. And marga is a term that might not be familiar to everybody. Um, <clears throat> you know, most people know it to be maiden, mother, crone. But, of course, our lives have elongated such a lot the crone really is, you know, the very elderly woman sitting with a blanket over her knees, you know, crocheting. So mm -hmm. the difference between mother and crone, there's a heck of a lot of years these days in between. Mm -hmm. So there's a new phase called marga. And marga is when you go through menopause. So you learn to hold, withhold your wise blood. And it's really the time when women are moving out into the community a lot more and we see a lot of very powerful women post-menopausal really mm. creating some amazing things in the world because they've got all this wisdom of what they've learned through all of the years. Not that women aren't powerful before they're because absolutely they are. So obviously for you, um, you're not at that marga stage. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about 
your menarche, your first um, blood, can you recall, you know, what happened at that time? Was it celebrated? Was it hushed up? You know, what was that memory for you and were there any lessons that you recall? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I was pretty young. So I was actually only about 11 and a half oh, when wow. I got my first period, yeah, and started going through puberty quite young. Um, so, yeah, I was just the beginning of grade seven. So um, I have an older sister who, you know, four years older. So I think I definitely remember, you know, seeing pads and tampons and all that kind of around and knowing that something was going on. But I really don't remember mum talking to me about it. And it, upon reflecting it, I was like, oh, okay, what, would, what will I do when Luna, you know, um, when the time comes for her? And I thought, oh, I really would like to warn her about it. Not warn, but... Um, tell her about it <laughs> because when it when it happened I really didn't didn't really know what was happening you know you start stuff starts coming out of some you know out of your um yeah <laughs> your vagina and you're like what's going on so um yeah I remember just asking mum you know what is this and then she explained whereas I think if I had had some uh, knowledge around what was happening before then it definitely wow. would have been a lot better better experience so you were really kept in the dark about it like it was it came as a complete surprise yeah I really don't ever mum ever remember mum saying um that, you know you get your period like explaining what actually happens wow um, sometimes I think she thought I I picked up a lot of stuff that I think she just thought I knew more than I did. Like mm -hmm. I remember when I first hopped in the car to drive, like I was driving this her 1954 Morris Minor up the hill and like bunny hopping, so I had no idea. And she's like, don't you know how to drive? I'm like, no, no one's taught me how to drive. Like, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. So I think like I, I always see I'm the youngest child, so older sister, older brother, youngest. So sometimes I just wonder if mum, I don't know, had the time or what to I think she she maybe thought that I knew more than I did about certain things but um yeah I really hadn't really had no idea <laughs> so. wow that's incredible <laughs> you know I talked to I had a little bit of not a um well some similarities for me my sister was 17 months older than me so I kind of did pick up a lot of stuff you know through um osmosis if you like yeah, through yeah. my mom talking to my sister because it was so close I kind of remember more about my sister getting her first bra yeah. um but my mum was really pretty open about particularly around sexuality and I remember her talking to us in primary school about that and saying I really want you girls to know I want you to hear the facts as mm. I know them rather than hearing hearsay mm. from school. And yeah. I really valued that, um, mm. that she sort of shared that. So I don't remember a lot about the conversation, but I do recall a girl in fifth class, Nina was her name, gorgeous European descent. Um, so obviously um, she, you know, was way ahead of a lot of the other girls and running out of the classroom screaming like oh because she she didn't have a clue what the blood was and yeah you know, so she was really scared by it mm. so um yeah i understand that um you know information is really valuable so i'm curious about picking up a point around this around um you know if we look at this as a blueprint for you in some way being a little bit surprised by it, um, how did you how did you negotiate that? How did you manage that? Oh, um, that's a really good question. Well, the only thing really coming up around that is that I was always like my period was never regular either, so it was always a surprise when it came. You know, it was never monthly. It was like six six to eight weekly. Um, you know, it took a little while to fall pregnant with Luna because they were never kind of that regular. Um, so definitely like a lot of fear because you kind of, you know, from four weeks onwards, you're going, oh, any time I could get my period. And I never really got massive cramping or anything. It would just kind of start to happen. Um, and I'm remembering uh, it was at the end of the year, actually, we had a, like a, a final, you know, breakup day or something. And we went to... Oh, where did we go? 
we went to like Coochie Mudlow Island or something and I had my period and wanted to go swimming and all that kind of stuff, but it, you know, hadn't used tampons yet. And um, I actually had a, a bit of an accident, like leaked onto my shorts. And I remember just feeling so embarrassed because I only had one pair of shorts and guys were there, you know, that I liked and trying to cover up and everything. So they just, to me, there's kind of a lot of, um, yeah, just, I like with Luna, I want to definitely be more open about it so that she knows what to expect and that it's um, actually, you know, it's a, a phase that is encouraged and um, yeah, not something to be embarrassed about. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or so, high because every woman gets, every woman gets it. And it's, well, it's that, yeah, it's yeah, the, <laughs> that we need to have miracle, babies. <laughs> exactly. The miracle yeah. of life, right? It's, mm. it's the system that, um, you know, there's so much value in, in our, in the wisdom of our blood. And mm. um, yeah, it's really so, um, I, I'm feeling like there's some more information that could be quite cool to unwrap a little bit for you around this. Um, I'm going to share a little story and then we might go on to birth and then see if there's any mm-hmm. dot points that line up there for you. And of course, you know, you, you've started this inquiry, so be open to mm-hmm. what gets delivered. So a couple of things um, that came up for me around, you know, I was driving recently up uh, with um, my daughter Ellie, um, who is 33. Um, She's moved up to Brisbane. So we went in the car and we had this amazing five days together, which was so lovely. And I was talking to her about these sessions. Mm. And so for Ellie, um, I was part of a, um, I I partnered at that time um, with a home birth midwife and she and I um, worked together doing a lot of women's work. There was workshops and on the phases of life and all this sort of thing. And also we built a community together, a community that honoured the seasons. And one of the things that we did do was we, um, and it still happens um, locally here, is that there's a maiden ceremony. So when the girls in the community um, get their first periods, within that next 12 months it's celebrated so they're invited into the women's tent and it's a beautiful ceremony where the girls receive gifts from all of the women and the women share with each of the girls things they wish they had have known um, to really bring the ritual and the ceremony and the beauty of course Mm -hmm. you know it can be inconvenient and it can be painful and those sorts of things but when we come from a place of this is so normal mm. and, you know, to be revered really and mm. how do we honour this in ourselves and we ignore the, you know, the just you can still wear the white pants and just, go, you know, continue on in life um, kind of picture that's put out there. But actually to really honour it and um, to make it the sacred journey Mm. that it actually is. So I was asking Ellie, well, you know, I know you've had a bit of a different way into that pathway than most, but what would you have liked to have seen? And she said, I thought all of the ritual and everything was really beautiful, but she said, you sort of missed out on all the practicalities, mum. And I was like, oh, okay, unusual for me being a Capricorn. I'm generally really <laughs> practical. But that was very interesting for me to hear her perspective. Mm. So I think that's the beauty of it, right, is that we have this open communication and that we can, um, you know, to, we can continue to learn um, how how is it that we can support our daughters and our granddaughters mm. and whatever moving into the future? So there's so many beautiful ways, but I think the most important thing is is that we take the time. Um, you know, Ellie did say to me, I remember you taking time, you know, I think I took her out of school or something and we spent the day together and doing nice things, buying nice underwear, whatever it was, oh, that wow. we did, very Beautiful. feminine sorts of things. Mm. Um, so there's, I think it's about stopping and honouring it and mm. then ways forward. So that's, of course, there's lots of conversation around that to be had. But what I want to do is keep moving on your particular journey. So then if we go forward to, you know, Luna's birth and, and mm-hmm. you know, you I mean, I've got some things 
that I saw from <laughs> on the outside, which mm -hmm. are completely awe-inspiring for me. And I know I've shared those with you before, but I want you to share for you, what was that journey like? And, you know, who were you getting to be in that process? So I should have grabbed some tissues. I'll just be one second. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. It brings up a lot of emotions. So. Yeah, absolutely. As it should, you know, it's a magic. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'll start with that Luna was a beautiful surprise. So um, we hadn't necessarily been trying, but we hadn't necessarily been not trying as well. <laughs> Weren't being massively careful, but um, because I had such irregular periods and, you know, we, um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, so 2017, beginning of February 2017, uh, Lena chose to um, make me a mum. Well, we conceived and then, um, yeah, so we got married in June. So I was all kind of focused on getting married, you know, the wedding and everything. And then she decided to join the party. So I was about four months pregnant when we got married. And, um, yeah, so interest, like it was a bit of a roller coaster pregnancy. So... Um, I found out about six weeks that I was pregnant with her, so pretty, pretty early. And then, yeah, started having like, um, oh, I won't say morning sickness because it was any time of the day. So <laughs> pretty interesting um, sickness throughout that. And I've had type 1 diabetes for 20 years. So, you know, managing vomiting while having a hypo, you know, that was some pretty rough times. <laughs> Plus I was working a lot of hours as a, as a support worker. So um, I had to kind of tell the people I was working with pretty quickly because I was, I was just so hungry as well. <laughs> like I was eating so much food and um, yeah. And then about a, a week before the wedding, I got a uh, gastro and ended up in hospital overnight because I worried about her. And that was kind of the start of, um, so yeah, there were lots of, it doesn't sound like a great story, but it is. <laughs> So there are lots of hospital visits having type one. So um, the Royal Brisbane were amazing. So as soon as uh, they found out I was pregnant, <clears throat> excuse me, um, appointments every couple of weeks to make sure that she was growing well and I was healthy. Um, yeah. And then, so it was about, uh, I think the first time I was actually hospitalized, I ended up getting pre preeclampsia. So really high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, it was actually on my birthday, <laughs> so it's like the night before my birthday. So I was in hospital my birthday morning, um, but I was just so grateful because I was pregnant with her and healthy, and I was about 27 weeks pregnant at that time. And, um, you know, later on I found that some, you know, some women uh, birth, you know, can obviously birth earlier, but I was just so grateful that I was healthy um, with that. So I think I had about three or four hospital visits in total. I really didn't like staying at the hospital because <laughs> John had like John had to drag me a lot of the time because if my blood pressure uh, blood pressure went too high he'd be like come on I have to ring Orc which is um obstetric review center <laughs> I'd pretty much be kicking and screaming because you know you get poked and prodded and you know you're in um suites with you know three other women and yeah it's pretty full on so um, but I had angels looking after me. One of the ladies that John had actually uh, spent a lot of time in martial arts, she actually worked as like the nurse unit manager at the Royal. Yeah. So a couple of times we've got private health, but we're in the public health system. She got me um, a private room, which was just incredible. Yeah. So um, um, towards the end, they started doing some scans and she'd been so she was always a, a big baby because of my type one. So it was pretty well controlled, but she was always at like the 97th percentile. And towards the end, they were a bit worried that um, my placenta was not doing what it needed to do and, and all of that. So I spent about a week or so in hospital um, before they basically said she needs to come out quickly. So um, they asked me if I wanted labour. I was very pro-labour before. I knew that I'd be induced at 38 weeks, which I wasn't too happy about. But um, basically because of a bigger baby, they wanted with type 1 at about 38 weeks, they, they want Bubby out. Um, 
but yeah, pretty much at that stage, I was just a bit worried because they said that blood was looking like it was being diverted more to her organs and her brain, et cetera. So I just said, yeah, let's book a cesarean. In. So I am a bit up, like every so often I get a bit upset about that because that's not how I saw it going. Um, hmm. But she's healthy and well, so <laughs> I think that's the main thing. Yeah. So uh, I so thought she was a boy, actually. She was so strong in my belly. <laughs> that I thought I was having a boy <laughs> and um, she was born on a full moon. So 6th of October, 2017. So she's a Libra. She was meant to be a, Sag a Scorpio, I think. Scorpio's after Libra. Fiery and... Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I know that end of the spectrum too well, but yeah. Because to me, she's more Scorpio, like, you know, she's right. more fiery rather than... <laughs> right. Okay. Then Libra's balanced, isn't it? The scales. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and actually, it's funny, her original due date was the 11th of the 11th, 2017. I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, wow. And it kind of changed, yeah. yeah so yeah. She, was, she was born at 35 weeks, so uh, a little bit early. Mm. And um, we had a little bit of skin to skin. Um, her blood sugar was actually really low. It was like one millimole per litre, which she was having a, a low blood sugar as soon as she was taken out. And um, so, yeah, she's pretty much carted off to special care straight away. Wow. And yeah. Take a, take a breath. <laughs> anyway, there. Sorry, yeah, it's a full on story. <laughs> yeah, look, it's a beautiful story. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's, it is, um, you're, you've uh, padded out some details because, of course, I saw a lot of the pictures and, and, and watched the journey as you were going along and I I just had a sense of you know how much of a rock star you um, are for going through that process and I really want to honor that with you and also you know the inspiration that you are to other women of your way you carried yourself through this whole journey what comes up for me again is this, I mean, I think the, the word, I don't think, I feel the word surprise has got so much juice in it for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Menarch surprise, <laughs> Lunar surprise. Yeah. You know, like even the cesarean was a surprise because mm. that's not how you saw it going. Mm. And I would um, suggest to you that there's some healing that you could be doing mm. by... Um, reworking your birth story mm. um you know like i mean i know this this wasn't the point of this conversation necessarily today but this is where it's going so i'm going to go with that how we you know how we um process and then share our story is really important as to how we move forward and i can still i can feel the energy of sadness, disappointment, whatever mm. that is, almost, mm. dare I say, you know, failing on any level in your own mind when you share your story. Mm. So something that um, I have found incredibly powerful um, and know that it, it is really empowering with any aspect of our life, but particularly with our birth story, is that we uncover that for ourselves a bit more and then write that story from a very empowered place because this is a powerful story <laughs> it's mm. a super powerful story you've you you've alluded to that in the you know not not one you know i mean there's a lot of um people with type one that wouldn't contemplate having a baby first pointer Second, you know, the, the, the preemie babies because of that. You mm. know, you've overcome all of these obstacles because of who you are. That, to me, is a beacon of light for so many. And I know I've shared this with you before, but I feel like that's your blog space, that's your sharing your message space, you know, to support other women because you've been there, you've done mm. that, you know how challenging it is and, and because it's challenging doesn't mean, you know, we didn't, you know, it's not the hero's journey and this is absolutely the hero's journey. When I um, birthed Jessie, so my third, 
Mm. Um, and, you know, for all of my pregnancies, each of my children called me to do different things. Before um, birthing Jesse, I was in a very, um, a gym junkie stage. Mm. And I had a six pack. Um, like I was very, um, very trim and um, very fit. And I continued to do high impact aerobics right throughout my pregnancy. And, you know, back in the 90s, that was sort of crazy leotards, you know, kind of almost mm. Jane Fodderish. I mean, yeah. she's a lot earlier. But, you know, step classes and yeah. jumping up on boxes and yeah. crazy things. So he, um, he, was, um, he was quite little when he was born. Well, he was littler than my other two, but he was born literally on the front doorstep in about 50 minutes with all of the family around, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was quite shocking in as much as that it was like, what just happened? Yeah. Um, and I told my story from that place for a while. And then when I spent time working with my story, I was actually able to see the truth of it. Mm. And the truth of it was that I, I had this inclination that um, I wanted the whole family to be around Jesse, And I didn't know why, but I just knew that felt like that was right the right rite of passage for him was to at least have his brother and sister there. But as it turned out, his grandparents were there as well. And, um, and I wanted to do that. And at the time, the hospital um, where we lived wasn't open to that, um, the children oh, yeah. being in there. Mm. So he kind of took things into his own hands. And, of course, being gone at home, he did have his whole family there, my parents. It was a little chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if I then look at Jesse's life, a pro snowboarder, he's had an entourage his whole life. My mm -hmm. my mum and stepdad included. Like, we have all travelled with him, supporting him on his journey. So it's like... Ah, it makes perfect sense. So when mm. I rewrote that story and realised that this was his journey and even to those sort of things like she was meant to be born on, no, she was meant to be born on the 6th of October. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like there are no meant to be's, everything's mm. perfect. So maybe spend some time around that and just take a bit more of your mm. goddess power in that because it's a very powerful story. And that surprise element again, I think there's, I just, I'm intrigued to see what you uncover around that because there's a lot, a lot in that, I believe. Yeah. Well, Lena's always surprising us with the thing she's doing. So. Totally. <laughs> and that's going to yeah. be, that, that's probably a, theme, I think. a bit of a, yeah, a theme, exactly, a bit of a yeah. blueprint. And that will help you mother her, mm. knowing that about her, you know, yeah. that she'll, um, you know, yeah, you'll work those things out. But that's um, that's really cool. And would you, Thank you. you would um, kind of, if you were to say what did you learn from your birthing process, what would mm -hmm. you say that message is? Yeah, definitely. So the big gem in all of that was trusting, was trusting and us, uh, trust surrender and I always knew she was okay so because I could feel her kicking mm. and growing and strong you know she used to she used to love doing tumble turns at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> so you know my belly would go half you know yep. half size because she would go to that so, yeah <laughs> you look down you think you've got this alien in there because you you know she's on one <laughs> side of you this is crazy um yeah, you know, everyone, it was just really knowing for myself as well. So that's where my love of personal development just helped me so much because I had so many people, you know, trying to tell me stats and stuff about preeclampsia and diabetes and babies and, um, you know, all the negative stuff that I just always trusted that I felt that she was okay. Mm. Um, and, you know, I was just kind of tapped into that and, you know, just really wanted to keep positive for both of us. And, <clears throat> yeah, I just... I always just felt that she was okay. Mm. It was almost, it was, I don't think I was in denial, but it was almost like it was kind of separate because I felt that she was okay. Yet all this kind of other medical stuff is saying she's not okay and you've got this. And 
yeah, it's a little bit hard to explain because no, I could just feel her growing and strong. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And I think that's so beautiful that that's such an important thing to remember. And, and perhaps the reason why you, you know, you were able to get to 37 weeks and on all of these things and not to make anybody else's story wrong because we're just talking about your story, but that what you're talking about there, that level of knowingness, checking mm. in with you and your baby, ah, oh, yes, you would know when you need to act. Yeah, and definitely. You were doing the things you needed to do but not buying into the hysteria and the, mm. you know, the, the fear what the... could, yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, being sensible and, hey, right now we all need that in our life, yeah. right, with the hysteria that's out there at the moment. So um, that's such a beautiful grounding way to, you know, to remember that, you know, that's energy has served you really well mm. and I would suspect that that will continue to serve you really well as you mother and continue on your own journey mm. um, and I just yeah I feel like I'm being reminded to talk about this surprise so I really mm. feel like um, you know Luna yeah let's remove good or bad and let's just talk about that theme of surprise in your life and you know, what that might mean for you, um, these surprising elements. And I think that that's what's going to come out more and more in your story as you, as you write this a little bit more, that there's, you know, a little bit like, oh, I didn't actually see that of myself or I didn't, I didn't know that of myself. So mm. as you expand more, that there's that, that lovely surprise element of mm -hmm. you birthing more into you, mm. which I think is very cool. And, you know, join those dots as you choose to join them. And of course, as our children go through all of their phases, you know, we'll suddenly have stuff come up for us around that <laughs> phase in life that we're going, oh, okay. Definitely. <laughs> right. Yes. So we get another opportunity, right? I mean, they're mm. our greatest teachers. They okay. are, yeah. You know, I remember and you would know that yeah. already. When I found out I was pregnant, I was like, oh, the, I must have, I just remember going, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, because I just knew that she was going to teach me so much. And she always mm -hmm. says, she's just, yeah, she's very resilient. She's very, um, uh, yeah, she's a little empath. Yeah, picks up on. Yeah. Stuff. Mm. Yeah. Well, they stand on our shoulders, right? So yeah. they bring everything that we've got. Literally. Yeah, literally. She loves climbing on me. Yeah, yeah right. Well, <laughs> reminder. Yeah. That, you know, she's going to be that more expanded version of both you and hubby and, you know, that's the beautiful thing. So um, if we're open enough to, you know, to drop that old model of I'm the parent kind of thing. Mm. And, you know, of course we're going to give them parameters and to hold them in a space that allows them to feel you know, safe and all of that, but to actually, you know, to be really open and mm. see, you know, what it is that they're looking to explore in life and where they want to go. It's an incredible journey. And, um, yeah, I think it's, I, I just, I do, I, I feel very um, proud for one of a better word of you and of who mm, you, you show up as um as a woman and as a mother it's a it's a brave journey that you've um you know you might feel like it was a bit of a um a, a journey chosen for you but i'd say that you know you are up for it so you you know you allowed that to to come about so is there anything that's sort of coming up for you that you want to share before we um wrap this um I think I'm pretty complete. Okay. Thank what I would yeah. love is for people to understand, you know, like um, obviously there'll be people that watch this in the future and they might go, oh, wow, I feel a lot of resonance with Carrie. How can people get in touch with you? What's the best way that they can connect with you? Yeah, sure. So probably the um, best way is on Facebook or Instagram. So mm -hmm. if you look for Carrie Gurnett, so it's C-A-R-R-I-E. And Gurnett is G U R N E T T, -T and it's at the Sweet Life. And um, that's got all my details on it. You'll see lots of pictures of Luna and I, and lots of positivity. And um, 
yeah, all of this stuff that we get up to. Beautiful. Well, that's absolutely beautiful. And I'll make sure I put that in the notes um, here. And I'll, of course, send you the um, recording of this as well. So you can, you know, put it anywhere you want. Um, predominantly, it'll be going up on the YouTube, uh, my YouTube channel. Really? Um, so thank you so much for um, getting us started. I think there'll be many more of these conversations to be had. And please let me know if, you know, more of this, um, you know, comes to mind and um, what else comes up for you. But thank you. I really value your time and I love you lots and I'm so grateful for you in my life. Likewise. Thank you. I hope I was able to add some value to some people today. Definitely. Okay. Bye Thanks, for Kim. now. Bye.